Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, so we did not realize that you would be doing that so kindly of you, by the way. But if you go to the next slide, we just, I guess, wanted to show you our formal um, little icons that we use for everything. So again, I'm Melissa Langridge and I'm the Assistant Director and Coordinator of User Education and Outreach at Niagara University. And I actually worked previously with this lady. Yeah, hey everybody, I'm Natalie Haver. I'm over at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. I'm our online services librarian and I work firmly under the research and instruction team here. Um, and thank you so much for all your input in the chat. It's nice to see what everybody gets into. Um, I didn't mention it, but I'm a rock climber. Uh, I do do a whole lot of that. Um, not currently, I broke a bone in my foot, probably rock climbing and as it goes, ugh, as it goes. But anyway, if anybody's a rock climber, let me know in the chat. Um, but otherwise, we decided to consider this um, conference theme of, you know, promoting resilience and library instruction and help our students persist while transitioning into this era of online learning. And we thought this would be like a really good fit for this. So thanks so much for being here. Today, we're planning on just discussing Peloton as an inspiration. Mostly this is coming from Melissa. She's all about the Peloton. She'll let you know. <laughs> um, and then we're also taking a look at the evidence from sport pedagogy and um, coaching generally and motivational design in research. Um, and from there, we'll talk about what that practical application looks like in the information literacy classroom. So here we go. Okay, so I would like to know who is also a member of the One Peloton family with me. So please go ahead and use your reaction to raise your hand if you are a hashtag Pelo librarian. I mean, even if you don't use that hashtag, please just let us know if you are part of One Peloton or if you use something very similar. So for example, Natalie does um, use the Les Mills uh, app, but she has a different bike and it, it just works. So yeah, it's not so social media, -y, but we've got a couple takers there, Melissa. Can you see them? Two people raise their hand. That's not bad. Two Pelotoners. <laughs> I don't, I can't see. Let's see. Mm, click on participant. Well, um, oh, we got two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyone else? Because we're just going to take another second or so. We've got a question in the chat. What's Peloton? We'll answer you right here, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> Good one, Liz. <laughs> Okay, we just want to see there's only one attendee who is part of one peloton well I mean, there was great. another it times out after a minute we had two so right but i mean there's no there's not 50. no not 50 in the room okay. okay all right then we will get going so we thought maybe that would be the case so i want to show you an example of what it kind of looks like because it's just a little taste. I think that they do things really well. And that's why it's so popular. Um, this is Alex Toussaint, which he went to military school. So if you're in the mood for an intense ride or and or hip hop music, this is your guy because there's a trainer for everyone. And let's just give you a taste. You thought today was daycare. You thought today was going to be a walk in Central Park. Congrats, you played yourself. My name is Alex Tucson, and I'm here to kick yo, just in case you didn't know. Asking the music, giving that breath that does If somebody told you every single day, he's you got 20 seconds to be the best version of yourself, what would you do? Me personally, I'm gonna go overboard, baby. I'm gonna outwork because I wanna be great. How you feeling right now? It's all me, baby. It's about that Twice time of the ride, baby. baby. Where well, you start to fall in love with that process. You love that circle, you embrace it. Stop chasing the destination. Embrace the journey, baby. If you had to make a modification, and you're like, AT, I can't do it out of the saddle. Shut up. Stop playing yourself that you can't do it. I understand one day that you will, all right? 15. It's slow progression, baby. Slow progression is still progression. Don't play yourself. Don't be that person out there like, I'm not gonna try because I won't succeed. That is how you fail. The only way you fail is if you don't even try, Peloton. Big team, baby, come on. I promise you with all, all the love in my heart. I'm never afraid to fail a life, you know why? I'm just thinking about having an opportunity to even try, baby. I'm proud of y'all. Huh. Don't you stop now. 
Okay, so that's just a taste. Now they're all different. They have different personalities, Sorry. but you know, Here sometimes you're in the mood for that. Yeah. Now, did you notice there were no riders on the bike in the back? Now you can actually go to their studios in New York City, pre-COVID. See, there they are, um, and you could take rides for free with them, is my understanding. And in the older episodes, you could. However, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking to myself, I feel like I have been teaching to no one, right? There's a lot of just dark screens with the names, right? Or if you're screen sharing, no one's saying anything to you. You know, often they're not interrupting you and you just feel like you're teaching yourself. You're just teaching into the void. So I was wondering, how are they doing this? Even when they say they're going to give you a break, they don't really give you a break. They just keep talking for the entire time that it's there. And it's all motivating and it's wonderful and it keeps you moving. So today's point of the lesson is to learn how to apply their motivational techniques to information literacy instruction. So I just wanted to show you a couple of things that, you know, Peloton's not going anywhere. There's so many people that are using this. According to their 2020 annual report, this startup has now garnered 1.83 billion US dollars in less than 10 years that they've been around as a company. Um, they achieve higher hardware gross profit margins, higher customer satisfaction scores, and higher customer retention rates than Apple or Tesla. That is amazing, considering it is just under 10 years old. So this, I just wanted to show you that we worked out a lot in 2020. What else were we doing? But if you'll notice, it just keeps increasing. So there's about 18 uh, workouts per user um, in 2020. And then on the next slide, we're going to show you that even though the gyms have reopened, the statistics are going are still on the rise. And as of May 2021, there are 1.6 million subscribers in four different countries. And they're now going to open to Australia soon. Um, so the subscriptions during the pandemic increased, yes, but they're, they're just continuing. It's a major beast. So what makes Peloton work? Last year, it seemed like the only party you were allowed to attend. attend. And you didn't have to go anywhere to attend. So it was pretty great. Uh, each session, they consider a show. And for those of you that are, you know, into this, you, you know that it's very entertaining. I mean, there's an episode. I keep, he's not my favorite, but he is definitely one of them. Cody Rigsby has like one that's XOXO Cody and he gives dating advice. So it's almost like, it's amazing, right? So I'm sitting there doing a ride, but he takes four minutes of a song to answer questions from users. So fun. Um, they offer their personal stories on the bike and off the bike. And they continue to um, engage with you so that you get to know them, which I don't know that if that would work in person. Can you imagine going to a soul, soul cycle or even Peloton in person and trying to like approach these people? I would never, but online it's way easy. So I think that, you know, building connection is there. And then you also feel proud of them. Like Cody Briggsby recently um, he's in a GM car ad with Malcolm Gladwell. I'm, I'm so proud of him. I don't know this guy, but I feel like I do, right? And so that's that's something that they really do well, I believe. Um, they also switch up their, um, they modify their workouts, right? And so that's how you can get through one of these intense workouts is because they will let you know what's going on, what's coming up, and there's no confusion. Um, they will even switch up the ride by song or chorus, whether you're going to do a um, you know, a speed run or, you know, jumps, you know that you can get through it because they'll tell you when it's going to end soon. Right. And they have theme rides, you know, like XOXO Cody, and they're proud of you for just showing up, but they do insist that they, that you give as much as you're able. They call out numbers to make sure you have a great workout, but they remind you that they're just su suggestions and it's up to you to give what you can that day. And then do you feel better about yourself? Right. I, don't know. I do. So I'm going to show you on the next slide here what it looks like when you complete a class, okay? And this is part of what gets you to. It's not just the trainers and the experience they provide or the ride itself. It's all of this stuff, these extras. So this is Kendall Tool, And see how there's people behind her now? This is pre-pandemic, this screenshot. But on the right-hand side, that's your profile. And when a class ends, they will give you your digital badges. What did you complete? They're going to give you the rank with the leaderboard, where you placed on the leaderboard, um, your output, 
how much distance that you gave during that time period, how many calories you burned. I mean, as a libra librarian, statistics really get to me. And I am influenced by these numbers, I have to say. On the left-hand side, that's the feed. And this is where you can interact with other users. Well, it's one way. So other people that are also on the ride with you. And this gets big too. I do believe that the Just King experience, it's a show, I don't know. Um, on New Year's Eve ride. Yes, that's what I was doing. I don't know what you guys are doing this year, but it was a little different. There was like 10,000 people riding at the same time. When would that ever happen? So it's kind of amazing that this exists. Um, but that's how you can high five during the ride. So there's some downtimes to recover. And then you can like engage with other users. You can even set it up where you and your friends are in the same session. And so you kind of hold each other accountable because you're meeting at the same time, you're riding together and you're competing with them, right? That's when I get most competitive. I, I'm just writing just to have fun, but not when my friends are on there, it's terrible. I don't know. We're all different, I guess. So then they have your profile on the next page here. Yeah, oh, that calendar, if it doesn't highlight a day, oh no, I failed myself. It really gets to me. And I know that not everyone is like this, but someone who has an addictive personality who, is you know type a and has deadlines and things like this thing kills me more so than any other numbers that they throw at me how many weeks you've been working out how you compare to last month and then i just keep challenging myself oh it's just a it's a good thing this is healthy right because <laughs> otherwise it could be considered bad next slide all right so as you all in the session can hear melissa is drinking the peloton kool-aid right? She is right. I am looking at this from a much more like I'm, I'm going to take a look over through all the scholarship in the field of sport psychology and sport pedagogy. And so um, to start us off, I thought we would get into some definitions here. Um, the first one, intrinsic motivation, right? So this is all the basis of motivation design. Um, it's the internal incentive to engage in a specific activity, right? It's the thing that is um, perhaps in the classroom would be someone's general interest in a subject. And then we've got the opposite, which is the extrinsic motivation. That's the external incentive um, to engage in a specific activity, right? So again, if we're thinking classroom stuff, that's course grades. That's your extrinsic motivation. You want to get a good grade in the class. Um, and then if we... Uh, Oh, these are from APA Dictionary. If we keep moving on here to the other big base of this whole thing of sport pedagogy is this idea of self-determination theory. So this is, um, you can read the definition here, but it's a social cognitive theory of motivation. It focuses on the social factors, right? So the coach behavior or the teaching style that influence the various form of motivations. And then it's a little bit meta here, but it's their influence on your perception of self-determination, right? So the folks that came up with this, and some of you may be, um, you know, if you've done a, quite a lot of instructional design work in the past, you may have heard the names Desi and Ryan. And so Desi and Ryan um, are the ones that came up with this self-determination theory. Um, they started their work in the 70s together, and I think, honestly, they're still doing some work today, which is wild to me. Um, but basically what they did was at the time they toppled that belief that the best way to get human beings to do something is to give behavior rewards. Um, they had this whole thing about people doing puzzles and they paid a group to do puzzles. Um, and then another group, they just, they had them just do the puzzle without getting any reward. And it turned out the people who were doing it um, on their own because they liked puzzles uh, did much better. And they stayed at it quite a lot longer. The people who were being paid when they were given a break, they stopped. Um, the other folks, they never stopped. They just wanted to keep going because they were intrinsically motivated, right? So that's this whole thing. And in an interview recently, Ryan says, you know, we're interested in what we call high quality motivation. So when people can wholeheartedly engage in something and can really have both their best experience and their best performance, we've always been interested in the factors that facilitate or undermine that motivation. And in investigating that, we came up with this idea that there are really basic psychological needs that everybody has, whether it's in the classroom, the workplace, or a sports field that can help them thrive to their highest quality motivation. So those basic uh, psychological needs are autonomy, competence, and relatedness. And so that's the whole theory in a nutshell. 
The next generate generation, uh, excuse me, the next definition here is autonomy supportive teaching or coaching, right? So this is that the adoption of a student focused attitude and an understanding of interpersonal tone that supports intrinsic motivation and supports that internalization. So quick recap of coaching scholarship, and I can't uh, recap it all because article after article discusses just these things, but everything from a motivated high school students all the way up to Olympic le level athletes, right? So um, coaching pedagogy has long since viewed athlete motivation as a keystone of success. Much of the research surrounds intrinsic and extrinsic motivational factors. Um, so one study, this one, the Gillison, Standage and Skevington, they found that extrinsic motivation um, or extrinsic exercise goals, I should say, so things like weight control or increased body tone actually are negative predictors of self-determination motivations, while intrinsic goals such as overall fitness or mood improvement, health and enjoyment, those are the positive predictors of whether or not people um, stay motivated, uh, they have higher levels of, of physical activity. So they found all of that in 2006. The Molina and Merrick study here recently, 2020, they were taking a look at fitness apps, and why people start using them, why people stay using them. And again, they found that users' motivations vary at the beginning, but then again, the folks that um, like had a deeper intrinsic motivation end up staying longer with these apps. So. I think Melissa is probably one of those intrinsically motivated people. I'm, I'm just going to assume here. So uh, there's a great study that was put out by Mago and Valerian in 2003, where they came up with these seven supportive behaviors of coaches or seven autonomy supportive behaviors. One, provide choice to athletes. Two, provide rationale for tasks. Three, acknowledge the feelings and perspectives of others. Four, provide athletes with opportunities for initiative taking and independent work. Five, provide competence feedback that does not control or direct behavior. Six, avoid coaching via control. So they really proved that bullying doesn't work. It's really interesting because I think there's still a lot of bullying going on in coaching, but regardless, the last bit was seven, reduce the perception of ego involvement. And so by that, they meant uh, you know, the coach's own drive to win should come second. Like they need to take themselves out of it to be good coaches. And, um, you know, we're going to go a lot more in depth in the last part of this um, presentation today about how we might relate all of these thoughts back to the information literacy classroom. But while this slide is up, I thought I might just take a second to think about, you know, how can these coaching behaviors map back to techniques used in the information literacy instruction classroom? And so provide choice to students. We do this all the time, right? So selecting your own topic or demoing, if you demo more than one resource, maybe we give them the opportunity to pick whatever database they want to do the searching in. Provide rationale for tasks, right? What, explain what they're doing today, why? Um, acknowledging feelings and perspectives. And here, maybe I'd like to say, advocate for librarians not to use tough topics in class. Don't use police brutality examples because we need to be aware that our students of diverse backgrounds you know, may not want to go down that road in a library instruction classroom, right? Um, providing feedback, we do this as we walk around the room and give them one-on-one -on -one attention. Or in the library, you know, perhaps in the chat, we do the same thing if we're online. Um, and avoid coaching via control or reducing those perception of ego involvement. You know, always keeping inside that guide on the side philosophy, you know, as much hands-on work as possible. And, we're, and like I said, we'll go in further as we go. So a couple more studies, I'll just recap briefly. Um, Mallet in 2005, he was an Olympic coach. He did Australian relaying team and he used the seven um, autonomy supportive coaching behaviors. And he found that it just increased the quality. Like he basically just said this, these tactics really work. And he used it at an Olympic level and saw um, tangible and like the, uh, he could prove that the, the coaching worked because he did, he had it, a full study with two different relay teams. Um, Amber Rose in 2007, he was just a sort sports psychologist and he completed this big old um, literature review that um, found a direct correlation between the use of autonomy supportive coaching behaviors and athlete motivation and performance. And then finally, I'll mention Perlman. She does a lot of work with motivation 
um, but at the high school level. And so again, same thing where she's taking high school students, ninth graders, and finding that um, the most, uh, they did you know, a before test where they, they gave their own ratings of their motivation and the most A-motivated students, the ones who had no motivation to work out, um, were impacted uh, the best by the, the teaching style of autonomy supportive teaching and coaching in that phys ed classroom. So just to wrap it up, article after article kind of says the same thing, that the coaching style, uh, uh, there's a relationship between coaching behavior and style and athlete motivation and athlete motivation level correlates to athlete performance. And so many of those tenets of what it makes an exceptional coach can transfer, right, to what makes an exceptional teacher. And then this takes me to my third part here, or our third part of the day, motivational design. Switching gears just a little bit to kind of focus more on instructional design tenants. So motivational design is the process of arranging resources and procedures to bring about change in people's motivation. Um, John Keller began researching and writing about motivational design in the late 1980s. He builds right upon that work from Desi and Ryan. He also says that consequently, motivational design is concerned with connecting instruction to the goals of learners, providing stimulation and appropriate levels of challenge, and influencing how learners will feel following successful goal accomplishment or even failure. So here's a good kind of um, just image of how he feels motivation design fits within instructional design, right? So you can see it's just a subset and should be considered. Um, he advocates for every lesson plan to include some form of motivational design within. He comes up with these four concepts in his, what he calls the ARCS model of motivational design. So attention, relevance, confidence, satisfaction. So this structure asks designers and instructors to gain their learners' attention, demonstrate learning relevance, and ensure that the learners are confident in their own success and provide opportunities for learners to experience satisfaction from their learning. And I will say, if anybody picks up this book, he has a chapter dedicated to each of these four concepts um, where he gives um, all sorts of good lesson plan ideas that you guys might be interested in. Um, but I thought maybe I'll just recap really quick with one more chart. So um, I think some of these things, what he calls process questions might be especially useful for library instruction classrooms. So how can I make this learning experience stimulating? You know, his main suggestion is to invoke curiosity. So we're in getting attention with a sample question or using video polling software, something to catch their interest at the beginning, perhaps even using competition. I think Melissa would like that. Gamify the classroom. That's all those attention, attention tactics. Uh, relevance, of course, this is likely a slam dunk for you guys, right? So why is this valuable? Um, provide that rationale, right? I think we always, we all do this. Confidence, so how can I, via instruction, help the students succeed and allow them to control their success? You know, a great one for all of us to reflect upon. Um, and I think many of those seven behaviors of an autonomous supportive coach fits within this really well. But for example, that independent work and choice, um, great confidence builders, or perhaps even saying to students, you know, I want y'all to walk out of this classroom um, feeling confident, right? Telling them, I want you to feel confident and this is my goal for the day, that you're gonna be able to do all the research you're, you're being told to do by your professor. And satisfaction, you know, again, isn't that always our goal, right? What can I do to help the students feel good so that they come back and keep asking us questions or that they know the librarians are friendly and that we're here to help? So I think all of this kind of relates to everything we're doing. And lastly, and I think, I think this is kind of bringing it home, and Melissa, you can feel free to jump in here, but you know, what we've learned from the research is that coaching pedagogy builds on the same tenets of motivational design and instructional design, and that those same techniques that coaches employ to make their athletes more motivated will also work really well for teachers, right? So this jump from coach to motivational design to librarian, right? And this idea of, of, of a good, this is the gradual release of responsibility, right? So the teacher saying, I'll do it, and then we do it. Collaborative, y'all do it together. And then you're able to do it on your own. Just as spin classes aren't new, the Peloton packaging is. So most of what we've discussed today isn't new to you either. 
we know that. What we're proposing is marketing the idea of library coach in name only to first year undergraduates as a way to engage their intrinsic motivation from the start of their academic careers. It's a concept that they understand. Self-determination theory research has demonstrated the link between numerous social contextual events, such as rewards, feedback, imposed deadlines, competitions on people's need satisfaction and subsequent motivations. The idea of librarian as coach is apparent to us because we're able to influence most of the same factors identified as affecting motivational outcomes. So author Paul Tuff was a guest reporter on the March 21st or March 2021 episode of This American Life, and it was entitled uh, The Campus Tour Has Been Canceled. The problem they found that as among students who do, do not succeed on tests, such as the ACT and the SAT, which those scores have been waived because they were canceled, right, during the pandemic, uh, they weren't required to make decisions on admissions last year. And it's oftentimes students never learned how to study in high school. That's what their problem is with they're not good test takers. Um, so oftentimes they put them in a remedial class and they found, well, one math professor at UT Austin says that he noticed that struggling students, when they were put in remedial math, they never really caught up. But if you look at the same students and put them in a challenging program and push them to see how well they could perform, they would rise to the occasion. So UT Austin Vice Provost offered smaller groups of academic support services to students who were struggling. And they suggested peer mentors, study groups, counseling, some orientations, et cetera. Give them a semester and maybe two, then mainstream back into um, the regular coursework and they don't really appear to be different from anyone else. So as colleges are looking to make up some of their COVID related deficits, acceptance rates might not matter as much as they once did. How do we help these accepted and underprepared students? We propose that using the term library coach makes us more accessible to these students. And we're proposing that the coach will possess the following characteristics based on our experiences. So, oh, and yeah, all of the research that was conducted. Enthusiasm, guidance, connection, and encouragement. And I bet you're doing all of this anyways. You just might wanna amp it up a little bit. So let's see, this could apply to students, undergrads that are young, new to campus um, to help them find their intrinsic motivations, but it also could be applied to those grad students and PhD students who are already intrinsically motivated, right? Like who doesn't want this? I do in my Peloton classes. How do you embed this into their academic lives? Well, during my in-person English composition classes during the fall 2020 and spring 2021, I sold myself as their library coach as a way to motivate them to do more. I just wanted to test my hypothesis informally. All this meant really was that I was a bit more extra than I usually am. Um, I, it was clear, I was clear with my agenda and attentions, just a little bit more than usual. I was supportive and offered those fabulous motivational lines that Alex does. I tried to, at least I am no Alex, during the session, just to encourage more output. Um, I compared when I put the agenda up on the board, I said, you know how you do leg day? Yeah, today's research day. This is your mental workout. So you might not want to be here, but we're here and we're not going to waste any time. Things like that. Uh, I did notice an increase in participation from all students with the in-person sections. Uh, they also seem more engaged and more students contacted me with follow-up questions than they have in the past. And I usually get a good amount, but it was even more so. And it was things that weren't related to the class. It was just in general, I knew I have questions for you. Yeah, and I'm going to just jump in here to say that Melissa contacted me in like December and she's like, listen to this idea, Peloton. I love Peloton. What are your thoughts? And I was like, yeah, all right. Right. Like, I think there's some research here. We'll get into this, you know? And, but when she planted that seed in my brain, like library and coach, right? So I maybe didn't introduce myself to a classroom in that, in that way, but boy, I started doing these things where I'd be like, all right, guys, like we're in here for 50 minutes. Let's do it. Like you might not want to be here today, but let's see if you can't walk out of here two sources closer to your end goal or whatever, you know? And I do think, I think, you know, and this is you know, what I think, but you know how it is, right? You walk out, you know, whether your students were with you or not with you. And I, I really feel like there's some impact here when you kind of just in your brain kind of reset, right? So really what we're telling you is what can we do to revitalize ourselves? And this is, this is our idea. So we'll keep on going here. So Library coaches offer enthusiasm and we must learn from our first virtual teacher 
the best teacher in the world is somebody who loves what he or she does and loves it in front of you. You know, I love Peloton, right? <laughs> I think I've sold a couple to my friends, but you demonstrate your love for the game and teach skills of the sport, right? So um, I tell them that I went to grad school for this so they don't have to. And that, and that might not be great, but they get it, right? So sharing our credentials and value instill expert status and help them to identify that they should trust us, right? Um, mentally prepare them for the task ahead. That's why you're starting early. You're here early because your professor wanted to give you the most opportunity to excel in this you know, assignment. Be real, a literature review will be hard. You're gonna get in your head if you do it right, but we'll be able to pull you out of it. Keep us posted, prepare them for the road ahead and tell stories, right? Storytelling, this is a technique that applies to so many different disciplines as a, a way to uh, get to someone's emotions, right? So I can't say this one. I, I would recommend that you actually tell a story that's from your own perspective, but I'm going to give you one that definitely works, an example that works. So my colleague tells a story about, she works at the same school as I, and she went to school there. So when she was an undergrad, she was called to the Academic Integrity Board on um, a claim of plagiarism. As soon as the words start to come out of her mouth that this was an issue, everyone turns and she's interested because, I mean, they're afraid of plagiarizing because it's not always intentional, right? So they want to hear what happened, how do they get out of it, and how do they avoid it themselves? And so that gets us into citing and the importance of avoiding plagiarism. So things that you can do to offer some enthusiasm. Library coaches offer guidance. Be clear about your learning objectives. Students need to know what's expected of them in order to stay motivated at work. At the beginning of each session, lay out the agenda for the day. You know the Peloton trainers talk almost constantly. You know what they're doing. You know what you're about to do be about to be doing. You know how long you're going to be doing it. And you know if I take a live class, sometimes there's confusion, and I don't love that. So that's a reason why sometimes I just go on demand. But it helps keep you on track just in case you go off topic. Like when you're telling stories now, you have to make sure that you know the agenda and you know how long you're going to be, right? So that's very helpful to do that. Uh, teacher guidance offers time on task and motivation, but offering choice and sense of control keeps them engaged. The brain loves novelty and not all students respond to the same content the same way. So plan to vary your tasks every 10 minutes in order to help keep students interested and motivated. Remember, on Peloton, they chunk up the ride based on songs, you know, uh, they climb, they speed run. We attempt to chunk our material too in order to keep them moving, to keep them engaged. Um, we include games. Well, I do because, you know, undergrads, I definitely do. And even the Peloton instructors need to do something, right? So they make you do a fast run during just the chorus, or they make you do touchbacks where you dance on the bike. I usually don't, but I do appreciate their efforts. Certainly. Um, they can't see me. Remember, I would if I was in the class with them. But simply because the class is offered during class time, it doesn't mean that the student's always ready to learn. So suggest beginner or advanced tasks in addition to the baseline standard of what you expect them to achieve. You know, work with them. Your willingness to offer modifications will help them trust you. Um, Peloton instructors always make it clear that they're proud of you for just showing up, right? Which I do appreciate because sometimes you're not feeling it. And they want you to just, you know, do what you can do, offer that day steal that, you know, and at the end of the se session, introduce supplemental content that's available to them on demand so they know how to get assistance at their point of need. And of course, you're always there. Library coaches offer connection. Engage with the students. Peloton instructors get to know their individ individuals before the class. You can see them like off the camera, which is kind of fun. I mean, they're on the camera, but they're not on the class. And it's interesting to watch them talk. So I tend to talk with the professor, you know, as you do too. I talk with some of the students, maybe you know some of them already. Um, it just makes you look a little more approachable, right? And that's all we want. Make pleasant conversation, ask them to give their name and their research topics. You can use polling software such as Jamboard or Nearpod in order to collect the responses and share with everyone. This is fun too. Like if you call their names out since you know them already, sometimes I give actual name tags and um, that way I know, because I'm not going to remember everyone, you know, you want your Peloton instructor to call your name out, right? Like I do, they have not yet. They called the person ahead of me on the leaderboard. That's the closest I've come, but you know, it feels good to get a mention in class, right? Being identified for your efforts feels good. So apply that to your teaching, of course. 
Group collaboration allows students to reach a conclusion and work out problems in advance with sharing of, with the entire class to avoid embarrassment. No one wants to be the first to call out, no one wants to be wrong. So allow them to work it out together. When students are auto-assigned breakout rooms online, maybe you wanna have some sort of quick icebreaker for the group to work effectively and naturally, even if it's, you know, just say your name and where you're from, you know, that way that they have something to go on. Draw how you're feeling right now. Um, just something to quickly get them laughing or bonding or interacting with each other before they take on their task. They've had, at least last year, their entire course was probably online. And how do they connect? So I found that that was really useful for them to do just to get a sense of knowing each other. And you could also assign a role and give a student responsibility such as, you know, timekeeper, note taker or something along those lines. Library coaches offer encouragement. Um, so you could always use pre and post test competitions using polling software such as Kahoot. Um, encouragement throughout. Peloton instructors cannot see us, but they still say how good we're doing and it feels good. Give encouragement to your students at the start of the class, um, during the assignment, when they're when you pop into the group groups online, you can just check how they're doing and you know give them some positive affirmation that they're on the right track. Um, and then more feedback when they're reviewing each other's results as you come back as a class. Um, did everyone produce the results you were looking for? Let them know. Be sure to send them off with the firm belief that they can replicate what they accomplished during the session according to the ARCS model, right? So you just wanna do a check-in with them, especially during independent search time. You could, after you went over it as a whole, you can do your independent, you know, working with them to make sure it's just more streamlined their techniques. Yeah, and I wanted to just jump in on encouragement, although I could have jumped in on all of these things to give more thoughts. But so far, Melissa's really been talking about coaching strategies in the instruction classroom. But I'd love to mention that we think that all four of these things would work really well for research consultations. Um, many times I meet one-on-one -on -one with students that have already, they already have all the skills they need. They just need someone to encourage them, right? And I'm sure lots of y'all have that same experience where they need somebody to friendly to cheer them on, to tell them how well they're doing, to, uh, you know, obviously perfect some of the skills or maybe work further with the guidance, ask more targeted questions to get better keywords and things like that. I could have probably chimed in with this part about research consultations under guidance section, but I really feel like lately, especially my one-on-ones are all about encouragement. I've been, I don't know, kind of dealing with motivation and um, confidence in students as it relates to library instruction for a long time now. And it was only through Peloton that I was really interested in how they made it so engaging online when they were speaking to just a camera, because that's what we're doing. So I've been, you know, tossing this around a little bit. And this is just one example from a hospitality course that I'm embedded in. So I do have assessment from fall 2016 to spring 2019. And just the pre and post test assessments alone, you can see that they are learning with just having instruction, okay? They, they know how to do things. But the next slide will show you that I've also been collecting information on how, do they feel confident? So I'm kind of interested in teaching to the affective domain, right? So if you'll notice, everyone feels more confident after. It's just the way you go about presenting the information. Um, so they just feel better and they feel like they can accomplish it. And that is the most useful thing to help them become successful, I feel. Um, 2018 though, there was no change. And this was some weird anomaly. I don't know what happened. I talked to the professor, <laughs> but I don't know. They were just that's what happened that semester. I don't know what went on. He knows there was an issue, but not with this. There was like something going on with that class, but still it didn't go down. So I was pretty pleased. I'll let it go. So basically, if you're teaching to the affective domain, I just wanted to show you this quote here. I, I live by this quote, basically, when it comes to one shot sessions. I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel by Maya Angelou. We have covered so much, right? Even though we try not to in a one shot session, some of it sticks, but it's like throwing it all out there. And you know, you never know. It depends on so many different factors of the students. However, if you make them feel positive, they will come back. And that's all we want is to be, you know, a necessary resource, reach out, reach out at the point of need. Um, 
So if you have enthusiasm, guidance, connection, and encouragement, students will come back. So yeah, we've got another quote, uh, another uh, question. Um, raise your hand if you consider yourself a coach. All right. All right. Bunch of people. Excellent. And then last, we thought, and oh yeah, lots of people. Oh, they come and go. The hands raising, they come, they go. Yeah, Jessica, you do now good. I'm so glad you see it this way. Yes, that's all we wanted to show you. Is <laughs> We're that, like, convincing you. All right. And then lastly, what? Which successful techniques have you used to motivate students? We thought we'd just open it up for kind of a bigger group chat in the group, in the chat feature of Zoom. Just go ahead. And I guess we're not unmuting. So take that out. Just put it in the chat. Um, if you, oh, humor and storytelling. Yeah. So lay it on us. We want to walk out um, with some more things to think about and pulling into our classes. I try to be humorous. I don't know. I think sometimes it's a little, I get crickets. Okay, I feel as though I used to be funny, but then I taught online. <laughs> and then I taught online. <laughs> and uh, I don't think that, you know, the profession of stand-up comedy is going to translate ever to an, a virtual event, right? We'll still see them in front of an audience and on Netflix. That's as virtual as it's going to get. All right. That's Amber's got game, gamification at the, at the beginning. That's good. Uh, Natalie Reese says, I let them watch me struggle. <laughs> yeah, me too, Man, Natalie. sometimes those database demos just fail, don't they? Oh, I know, but I think it's realistic. That's yes. excellent, Natalie. Thank you it for is. that. Yeah, and then bad jokes and puns. Bad dad <laughs> jokes, excuse me, yeah. Uh, some mindfulness and a little bit of yoga. Casey, I've been hearing more about that, right? Taking a moment to bring it in before we get started, maybe. Uh, being authentic. Yeah. That's part of failing right in front of them with a the search when it doesn't work. You're like, wait a minute. And then you go through the process, you know, as it live, I think they appreciate that. All right. Sam Harlow is saying that um, they start the class with a questionnaire about what they don't like about research. And then we address it throughout the, the session. So that's good. A question in the Q and a, yep. The humanizing self and the instructors. Aaron says that they try to be mindful uh, about uh, falling into the why you don't already know how to do this grouchy trap. So everything is an opportunity for learning. Yep. Empathy. I'm all about empathy in the classroom too, Jessica. Storytelling. Stelly, oh, Tina, excuse me. Tina says storytelling and breaks by suggesting someone will tell a clean joke. Oh, that's good. And topics that they can relate to. Yeah, all of the good things. Very good. And we had, let's see, there's a question in the Q&A. Let's see. Oh, yeah, because that's now we're going to do Q&As. But Willie, I do assume that they know it too sometimes, right? Because our jobs, you know, we're still teaching how to evaluate websites now more than ever, right? But I get excited too when they learn something new. And Or if someone says to me, um, you know, I've been to a few of these, but every time I come, I learn something new and I'm like, yeah, scaffolding, what? I never say that in front of them, of course, but apparently, you know, your work pays off. I, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. What is important in their tasks? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Excellent. Okay, so now we have uh, a question here, but feel free to use the Q&A to ask more questions. Natalie, do you want to ask? Well, Here's the beefy reference list. We've got two pages of these, but I shared the slides. If you scroll up a little bit, I shared the slides. So if you want our um, massive reference list, you are welcome to it. And now the official Q and A, um, and we'll we'll start us off here. Um, do you brand yourself as librarian coach, like a personal librarian program, or only within classroom informally? Melissa, why don't you take this one? Okay, I do both because instead of calling myself a liaison or your um, disciplines librarian. Like I've been struggling with what to call that thing. So I just say like, I'm the coach for your program. And, you know, of course it depends on the year. So if it's undergrads, only freshman or sophomore, then I do. Uh, in the classroom, again, if it's under like grads, then I will definitely say I'm your coach today. And I treat the entire 55 minutes as a mental workout. So I hope that helps. Natalie, do you have anything to add? Yeah, absolutely. So um, this is still new to me, right? So Melissa dropped this in my brain in December and I've not gone as far as to call myself a librarian coach, but 
my brain is there, right? So I'm starting to kind of think of myself as a coach and then using that to inform my lesson planning and my tactics in the classroom. I'm part of a little bit of a larger team of instruction librarians. So I think that uh, we tend to do things as a team, right? So we would all have to take on this thing versus, um, you know, what, I don't know. We, and same with personal librarians. I'm sure some of you guys are at larger universities where it would have to be like a whole team effort of, of changing uh, the titles of things like that. Um, so I'm not quite there, um, but it's something I'm considering. And, and I'm uh, my uh, boss's boss's boss has asked me to bring this slide deck to them, to, to, to the team of folks doing instruction to see, because uh, they want to know more about motivational pedagogy. So, all right, we've got one more question here. So Paul's asking, <laughs> yeah, William. Okay, so I'm sorry. Paul's asking, we have a large athlete population who I think will love this. However, a primary athlete campus or non-athletes already feel a little marginalized and maybe bristle at this approach. So advice or ideas for motivating a mixed group like this? In my experience, um, they already have academic support coaches assigned to athletes. And so I think I would just be part of that. Right. So I have tried to work with athletes specifically in that regard, but it wasn't in this context. It was just like, oh, a librarian's here to help you. We're going to come in with your coach, academic coach. So I think moving forward, I would approach it. But I think, um, you know, it's just it's just a branding thing necessarily. So I'm not quite sure. I think it would go over well, but that's something that we still have to look at this fall. Yeah, that's a good yeah. question. Yeah, and I agree with you too there, Paul. We've got, you know, um, especially with those first year experience classes, some of them are just the football players. Like I could see this just working with them, like perfect. The football players would totally understand librarian coach, you know, but mixed groups, maybe, maybe not so much, you know. And even um, Aaron Weimer, he's on, uh, he's one of the steering committee. When he, when he saw our opening slide, he's like, oh no, this is going to make me feel bad. And we're like, no, 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 no. So I can see that idea that like, well, this maybe isn't perfect, but it's something to consider, right? Well, and then I think the other thing is too, that it's a concept that most can grasp whether or not you're an athlete officially or not, because if you're new to the campus, you're probably going to be hanging out at the gym because there's not, you don't know a lot of people, there's not maybe things that you're going to be involved in, but you feel safe there, might as well spend some time there, right? So you go into the gym, you're working out. The Peloton thing too, is that there's so many people on it that just as someone joked in the comments, what's Peloton? Like everyone knows about it, right? So I think just this coaching is constantly trying to motivate us, you know? And I think even if you're not there on scholarship, there's also people interested in club sports. There's um, kids that just are into sports sports from age, oh, early, right? Mm -hmm. Through high school. And then some are on scholarships, some aren't. So, I mean, in America, sporting's big. Right. So I think that kind of, it just, I'm hoping- The concept, works. they could understand the concept, even if they are not themselves an athlete. More so than li liaison or other terms, because again, I find, I don't know about you, but our students, even I've worked in public libraries, they don't really know what a librarian is outside of books. And so I'm just coach is so broad and it is motivational, right? Like, I feel like everything I do is just telling them they're on the right track or just giving them, they're almost about to break down mm -hmm. so much, right? Mm -hmm. Or they're in their head because they're upper level and they're just like, what is happening? They're in their head. So that means you're on the right track. And so I just ask a few questions of them and they're like, oh, I never thought about that. And then they're back on track. You're an academic advisor to them. And it's, it's just been working. And I think I like the tagline that Paul, um, is it Paul here? There? Willie. Willie, I'm sure you have a tagline, everyone that you're already using. His is, I know I can help you. I'm a librarian, right? We all have our little techniques, our things that we already say. Mm -hmm. So this is just selling kind of what we do yeah, and, in their academic careers. I and echoing that whole thing. They do not know what a liaison is. I don't even know what it is. And I'm one, you know, it's three departments. I'm like, I'm your liaison. Then that means this, you know, I always have to explain it. So, oh yeah, let's see. And there's only so much you can say without overwhelming them. It's like having too many signs. It's just going to be white noise. Right. So you got to like hit them with yeah. what they need quick. Yeah, and, right. And um, Natalie mentions that, uh, that uh, she's a band geek 
and uh, speech team nerd. And I don't really relate to sports metaphors, but I'm totally a coach nice. cheerleader for my <laughs> nursing students. Me too. So, and I sometimes I'm like, I'll be your cheerleader today. Let's go. You know, I'll tell you, you're doing great. So excellent. Well, yeah. um, we'll if there's any other questions, feel free. And otherwise, I and feel free to stay on the chat or stay in here. But I just wanted to thank everyone um, so much for coming today. It was a really fun session to put together. And I learned an awful lot doing the scholarship part of it. So um, thank you so much. Yes. Thank you, everyone. We greatly appreciate your support. Yeah. And let us know if you have any questions or if yes. we can be a coach to you in this process. <laughs> and keep and, and go to the rest of the lit conference that looks great for the rest of the week. <laughs>